In this nitty gritty prime time let's play live stream, we're going to be playing American Mahjong at Mahjong time. This is our prime time session where we go over advanced topics. So I hope you're excited. We have a new topic today game theory mindset. This is a sneak peek into my upcoming book that I hope to release in the next couple of weeks. So I hope that you enjoy it. Please let me know if you have any questions in the comment section below the video, if you're watching the repost, or if you're watching live and you're a channel member, first of all, thank you for joining as a channel member. Second, write your questions in live chat. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you for watching my videos and for sharing about my channel. Moderators, thank you for helping monitor chat. Today's format is nitty gritty, so no socialization, please. If you prefer gameplay with commentary and a little bit of shenanigans, socialization, join us on Friday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern time for a more casual experience. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to get started right away. Say hi in chat while I get this going. I want to make sure everybody can hear me. All right, I guess I'll just get started. I know I can check my iPad. Hold on. Yeah, I can hear me. Okay, sound is good. Here we go. Game theory mindset. So this idea is something that I've been thinking about for quite a while. And it all started when I was playing poker for a time while I was also playing Mahjong. Well, not at the exact same time. I was playing poker in the evenings and I was playing Mahjong during the day on a weekly basis for a while. And I thought that there are some concepts that have been proven to help players play the game at a deeper level when playing poker. And so I thought, why not use these concepts and apply them to Mahjong? And that's what we're going to attempt in this presentation. So I hope that you're ready for a new way of playing the game. It's going to be a paradigm shift. So clear your mind, take a nice deep breath, because we're going to look at things a little differently with game theory mindset. I hope you're ready. With the game theory mindset, we're going to first lay a foundation. Then we're going to talk about setting the setting, wherever it is you're playing, the format, the people, and the framework. So all these things need to be considered when you're making this mind shift change. Foundation, setting, format, people, and framework. Is everybody with me? Hi, JL. Welcome. Do I have any poker players in the room? Let me know. Let me know in chat. All right, we're going to start with the foundation. With game theory mindset, the whole idea is that it is the study of decision-making under conditions 
over of uncertainty over time. So it is the the study of the process of game theory. So game theory as it applies to the mechanisms of the game, but also these other things that I briefly outlined on that opening screen. So we're going to look at these things because they all come into play when you're thinking about game theory. So the first piece is the foundation. That's kind of the bottom level. The study of the decision making under conditions of uncertainty over time. When, as far as Mahjong is concerned, just to take it a, or to uh, modify it and apply it to how it, how it works with Mahjong, is it is the study and application of strategic decision making based on information gathered by observing how people act and interact when playing the game. So that's the foundation that you're going to think about it from a, a different perspective, focusing on gathering information based on what you observe. Read the room in the nutshell. First, you need to think about the setting. And the setting would be either playing online, because when people play online, they play a little differently than they play in person. A lot of times, what I have experienced anyway, is that people are a little more aggressive when they play online. They may relax their defensive play when they play online. When people play in person, they typically play differently. And there's there are reasons for that. I think the primary reason is because there's a lot of intel that you can gather when playing in person that you're not able to do when you play online. So playing in person and playing online are two different experiences. So consider the setting that you're playing in and how you can gather information to help you make good decisions about the development of your own hand. Next, we're gonna talk about the format. There are different, there are really two different formats, but there are levels within formats. The first format would be playing socially. When you play socially, it's a little different than when you play competitively, like in a tournament. However, when you play socially, there are levels of defense depending on the group that you're playing with. And I, I attribute it to the culture of a group. I have a wiki article on it, and I'll try to remember to put this wiki article in the comment section or in the video description below. So if you play with a casual group where you're just socializing and having a good time, you may be lenient with the rules. So the game is a little different than if you play with a group who plays by tournament rules, for example. Their game may feel more like you're playing in a tournament. So the defense is high, there's uh, rules are followed strictly. But those are just a couple of examples of the two differences with layers, depending on the culture of the group for setting. Then we have the people. There are two variables that you wanna consider when you think about the players at the table. And this is where we're gonna get into some poker psychology. So if you're not a poker player, buckle up. 
If you are a poker player, I think you're going to like this. So let me know in the comment section if you play poker, if we have any poker players in the room. All right, let's get into these variables. So when you think about the players at the table, the first is that a player's personality makes them unique and their playing style may change as they build their skills. So you have the personality, which is just an individual's character traits and uh, their quirks, I guess you could say, their proclivities, their preferences, and that even applies to playing the game, which we're going to get into. But also, when someone first learns the game, they may play differently in the beginning. And then as they develop their skills and learn new strategies and learn how to apply them correctly, their, the way they play the game will change. And even their personality may be affected because as you gain confidence, you're going to display different mannerisms. You're going to have a different, different behavior. So even though you may notice a type of player who you frequently play with, it can change. So keep that in mind. The next things to consider would be that a player can adjust their playing style based on their opponents. For example, they could be playing with people of varying experience levels and different playing styles, which we're going to talk about. So for example, you could be playing with all beginners. You could be playing with a mixture or all advanced players. So there's some variance there. Also, some players may change their style of play based on the strength of the hand for a given game. Do they have weaknesses? Do they have gaps? And they may change the way they play based on those variables. Also, the format of the game, whether it's social or competitive, like we mentioned before. When I play socially, I tend to be more lenient when it comes to the rules and I, I relax a bit and I, I don't make corrections, for example. But inside, I want to, but because it's a social, social setting, I pull back a little bit. But if I'm playing with advanced players in a competitive setting, I'm going to play strictly by the rules and I'm going to call people out if I see an infraction. So I may, for example, disqualify a player in a competitive setting or with uh, an advanced group of players. But if I'm playing with beginners, I might be more lenient and maybe I won't disqualify a player, but use a situation as a teaching opportunity if they are receptive to something like that. So it really just depends. When you're looking at the players at the table, know that their style of play can change based on these variables. Is everybody with me? Thanks for coming, Evelyn. Appreciate you being here and thank you for moder moderating. All right, so next we're going to talk about a couple of spectrums that we're going to be placing players on so that we can identify playing styles. The first is called a flexibility spectrum. The flexibility spectrum is either fixed on one side and adaptive on the other. And there are varying degrees on that spectrum. So a player may be on this spectrum on the fixed side. They may have a tendency of, of picking a hand very early and sticking with it versus another player may play at the category level and maybe they don't pick a hand until the middle of the game. So that is the flexibility spectrum, fixed to adaptive. And somewhere along that spectrum would be a given player. 
Uh, let me see. I, I see a comment. Let me pause for a second. Okay, change the style. Change of styles and tactics, sort of play dumb. I would say that would be kind of like um, a bluffing maybe, but no, change your style of play more so that uh, th where you are adjusting your style of play to take advantage of a situation. So for example, if I am playing a hand and I have, it, and it is, let's see, maybe I'm not a good example because well, let's just hold that sh that thought a moment because we're going to circle back to this uh, because I want to introduce, I, I want to finish up with the, the spectrums and then I want to introduce the, the different playing styles and then we'll circle back to how things can change, variables can change the way someone plays. So we'll circle back and answer that question in just a little bit, Evelyn. It's a good question. So we'll, we'll circle back. All right, so I'm gonna get back to the presentation now. Uh, thank you for asking the question. Keep them coming. Uh, oh, there's a light across my face. Okay, hold on one second. Thank you. Okay, is that better? Sorry about that. It's because uh, my office is my dining room and there's a big picture window in front with blinds and the sun shines through. So is that better? Sorry, I know that was probably distracting. Uh, let's see, now that there's so little room for error, I can't see making a deliberate mistake unless someone can appear to make one. There's so little room for error. See, making a deliberate mistake. Okay, well, let's circle back to your question. Maybe this will make more sense as we go. All right. Thank you uh, for letting me know letting me know about the light, uh, Deborah. That would be the sun, big light in the sky. All right. So let's get back to the presentation now. So we talked about the flexibility spectrum that somebody may be more on the fixed side and some people may be on the on the adaptive side or somewhere in the middle. And it may even change depending on who you play with. So consider the flexibility spectrum. The other spectrum that you wanna consider is the risk tolerance spectrum. This is where you have the tendency of being a passive player versus an assertive player or an aggressive player. I, I debated whether or not I want to use the word aggressive because we don't like that term in American Mahjong. It's, it, it's, it can ruffle feathers. So I chose to use the word assertive. In poker psychology, it's passive and aggressive, but we're going to use the term assertive right now. We're going to start it there. So passive to assertive, and you can be anywhere on that spectrum. When you consider the flexibility spectrum and the risk tolerance spectrum and apply it to Mahjong, here are some ways that it might manifest itself during a game. Consider that we're playing after the Charleston. So we've gone through the Charleston. The passing is done. We're getting ready to uh, discard. Uh, let's see. Is this, uh, this may be during the Charleston or maybe uh, this is the begin game. So this would be when the after the Charleston, when the second wall is in play, the short wall. All right. So we have the fixed style of play. This is on the, the flexibility spectrum. So you have players 
who may pick a hand from the dealt hand, and they are they're probably going to stick with it through the Charleston and even through the pick and discard phase of the game. And their hand may go badly because they may be committed to something too early and they let something go and maybe they straddle different hands if, if they feel like, oh, I went the wrong way or something like that. That can happen with a fixed, with people who, who tend to play a fixed style of play. So then on the other side, we have an adaptive player. They tend to pick a hand or pick really a category more so from the beginning when you first get your dealt hand and they delay picking a hand until they run out of discards. That would be an adaptive style of play. So fixed players tend to pick a hand early. Adaptive players tend to stay at the category level and gather tiles for the category and then pick a hand later. They delay picking a hand so they can stay adaptive and go with the flow depending on the hand, how the, the tiles come in. Any questions so far? So this would be the begin game flexibility spectrum. Now we're gonna talk about the risk tolerance spectrum. And typically this comes into play in the third wall. This would be after the begin game, that short wall. Then we're going to push out the third, the third wall where that would be called the middle game. This is where you tend to see some change in players based on their risk tolerance. Passive players tend to delay their first exposure to control information, especially if it, an exposure would include a joker. So they would hesitate to do that. That would be a, a trait in a passive player. They don't want to lose that joker, they, so they're going to delay. On the assertive side, we have play a player who may want to expedite hand development so they're going to claim a discard and make an exposure even if it means losing jokers they're going to be okay with taking that risk probably depending on the development of their hand so a passive player may delay making the, that kind of an exposure with risk whereas an assertive player will accept the risk and move forward to expedite hand development so that is an example of middle game risk tolerance spectrum. In the end game, which is when the fourth wall comes out, here's another example of how risk tolerance comes into play when you play Mahjong. A passive player will tend to fold their hand, break up their hand and discard safely, play not to lose or play not to discard that winning tile. Whereas an assertive player tends to play to win, even if there is risk, they're more tolerant of risk. So they're accepting that, yes, there may be risk, but I'm going to push forward because I have a strong potential to win, a high probability of winning. So I'm going to push. An assertive player will behave that way whereas a passive player will pull back and they'll play more defensively because they, they have a lower risk tolerance. So when you think about the flexibility spectrum and the risk tolerance spectrum and you put it on a quad, so instead of two spectrums, we're going to put it on a quad. This is what you get. So on the left side, we have flexibility. That would be the flexibility spectrum where we have fixed on the bottom and adaptive on top. And then on the bottom, we have the risk tolerance spectrum where we have passive on the left and assertive on the right. So it makes a quad, four different squares. And we're gonna put players in the quad. Now, keep in mind, the first 
uh, slide, one of the first slides that I shared about the variables, depending on the setting the, and the um, format, you know, is it a competitive game? Is it a social game? Are you playing with advanced players or beginners? Are you playing with passive or assertive players? All those things kind of come into play and they may change the way somebody will play the game. So think, think about it and keep it fluid. So even as you think about your own way of playing the game, decide where you think you might be in this quad, in this, which one of these four quarters you would be in. And I'll share what mine will be in shortly. So you ready to go forward? First one we're going to talk about is fixed passive. Fixed passive would be what I'm going to call a stingray. This would be someone who tends to pick a hand early and they're going to be less reactive. They're going to wait to call a tile. They're going to delay exposing tiles as they develop their hand. They're going to be a bit more hesitant. That would be a fixed passive style of play. And we're going to call that a stingray. Then we have on the assertive side of a fixed style of play, we have fixed assertive, and we're going to call this an orchid. Uh, or an orca, not an orchid. I'm thinking flowers. Okay, so fixed assertive. This would be an orca. So we have a stingray for fixed passive. And for fixed assertive, we're going to say that this would be like an orca. Then when we go up to the top side of this quad, we have an adaptive passive player. And we're going to call this player a dolphin. And then at the top right, we have an adaptive assertive player we're going to call a shark. So we have fixed passive is a stingray, fixed assertive is an orca, adaptive passive is a dolphin, and adaptive assertive is a shark. This concept comes from poker psychology, and we're going to think of the game from that mindset. This is where all the game theory comes in, where you consider the personality of the player and their style of play and how they may behave at the table to help you make decisions on your own hand development. And that's what is going to make the game more of a sophisticated experience, more complex even. You play at a deeper level with layers. And to me, it makes the game more fun. It, it's fun in a different way. So I hope that you'll open your mind and think about this as it applies to Mahjong. What, does anybody have any thoughts about this before we go forward? Because we're going to talk about the framework next. So we, we talked about the setting the format and the players. We're going to go into the framework next. Okay, here we go. I don't see any questions. Let me see here. Okay. So let's talk about the framework now. When you're playing the game, you want to think about offense, kind of like offense and defense in, in any kind of a game. The offense when you play Mahjong is hand development, your hand development. So you want to focus on your hand development as the top priority because you want to be the first to win. So you focus on your hand development and then you do the best you can with the rest of the game. And we'll go into that in a minute. But when you think about hand development, 
you want to optimize hand development. So to do that with American Mahjong, that means you're going to target multiples because American Mahjong is a game of multiples. You're going to optimize by leveraging the multiples if you have them. And there are there are solutions for when you don't have a multiple. Namely, you would focus on or target the predominant pattern until a multiple forms. And then you target the multiple, reassess, and gather tiles for a category that supports your multiple so that you can optimize hand development. Because in the end, you're going to need multiples. Every hand on the card uses them. So if you target them from the beginning, you're going to set yourself up for success. So as you look at your hand development or the process of hand development offense, you're going to optimize. You're also going to look for ways to maximize. And that would be choosing a category on the card that uses most of your tiles. So in this middle example, we have a three, six, nine hand. You could also maybe do three, four, five, six, but here we're thinking three, six, nine uses the most tiles. And in this example, there are no multiples. So we're gonna maximize but if we develop a multiple, like in the first hand that you see, we have threes and fives paired up and even a one in there, you could maybe play little odds or two, three, four, five, three, four, five, six. So it's better to optimize, but you can also maximize. And there's no right or wrong, but there is good, better, best. So think about that. We have optimize, maximize, and then we have streamline. To streamline, you would be focused on consecutive run, not just the category of consecutive run, but just runs in general, because there are consecutive runs outside the category of consecutive run. There's a consec consecutive run hands <clears throat> in Winds and Dragons. There are three, actually, north and south and east and west with a run. And then there's also a consecutive run in the concealed hand, just two numbers, but it is consecutive. So there are consecutive hands outside the consecutive run category. So with hand development, the offensive tactics are optimize, maximize, streamline. Sometimes you can stack them, which creates what I call a power play and gives you a really strong advantage at the table. And we have a whole nother video or a whole uh, nitty gritty topic on the, this idea of power play, the power play and how to leverage these tactics to optimize your potential to win. All right. So we talked about hand development and then we're also going to talk about position. So after the Charleston, after you have gone through all the passes, whether you do both rounds of passing or only one, you never really know, depending on what happens at the table. Whatever does happen, though, at the end of the Charleston, you want to assess your position. If you have more than four discards, you are likely going to be an underdog for that game. And that just means that you want to take a low risk approach as you continue developing your hand. You want to try to get to a place where you have no gaps and few weaknesses. If you have four discards, I would say you would likely be a contender for that game. With this position, you can take a moderate risk and expedite hand development you're further along than somebody in an underdog position. So you can take more risks. And then if you have less than four discards, you are likely a front runner and you can expedite hand development regardless of risk because you're probably ahead of your components, your opponents when it comes to hand development. So underdog contender front runner, the position, relates to the level of risk that you can take as you develop 
your hand. And you have to be very mindful of what happens at the table and take all that into consideration as you play the game. Okay, we're going to keep going. We're going to talk about one more uh, concept, I believe, on the offense side. And that is what I'm going to call push judgment. This is a Mahjong term in other versions, but it applies to American Mahjong as well. And this is whether or not you're going to play to win or the alternative, which we'll get to. And we're going to call it push. This is whether or not you decide to play to win or push the hand and make it work, make it win. And you're, it's, sometimes it's a judgment call. Sometimes it's clear that you know what you need to do. Sometimes you have to make a judgment call. And sometimes you could be wrong. So there's that. But let's just talk about how to do this. So if you think your winning tile is in the wall or it may be discarded by an opponent, play to win. Discard the riskiest tile first and accept the consequences because you may incur a penalty and you may also get criticism from your opponents at the table if you're discarding a risky tile. And then, of course, if you win, win with dignity and humility. So there's a judgment there that you have to make. First of all, assess whether or not you think you're going to get your winning tile whether by discard or a pick from the wall, and then discard the riskiest tile first because it's only going to increase in risk. If you have a risky tile, the longer you hold it, the more risk it, it uh, the, the attribute of risk increases over time. So that's why you want to discard the riskiest tile first if you're going to play to win or push. This is the push judgment. Now we're going to talk about defense. So we talked about offense, hand development, position, and push judgment. That's all offense. Now we're going to talk about defense, discard planning. Simplify by looking for useless tiles, inefficient tiles, and subordinate tiles. So useless tiles would be if you're playing evens, you don't need odds. So any odd tile can go. Let's say you're playing evens, two, four, six, eight, and you have more twos and fours. You might keep fives, which are odd, because you could potentially switch to consecutive run with five being a filler tile, two, three, four, five. Let's say you have maybe three, five. You could switch from 2468 to 2345 if you have threes and fives in addition to your evens because those are filler tiles. So maybe let the sevens and the nines go. Those would be useless to you either way. So look for useless tiles. Also, if you happen to be playing consecutive run, look for inefficiencies. For example, an isolated tile. Let's say that you have a run of two, three, four, and then you have a seven. Even though if you get a six, you could go from three, two, three, four, five to three, four, five, six, or three four, five, six, seven, you might want that seven. But for the time being, if there's no six, that would be an isolated tile or in an inefficient tile, a seven on the edge of the run. One, two, three, seven, eight, nine. It's not efficient at all. If you want to stay in the range of four through six, four, five, six, if you can, because it's much more efficient. So Consider not only if inefficient tiles, but isolated tiles, especially if you're playing consecutive run. And then consider subordinate tiles, which are sim which would be similar to useless tiles. So if you're playing three, six, nine, 
you might just let fours go. They would be four, eight, the two, four, six, eight tiles, even though you may need, you want to keep the sixes, the two, four, eight, those are in a different category. That would, those would be subordinate tiles. You don't even care about those. You're gathering three, six, nine. Maybe you want to keep odds, which also would mean any two, four, six, eight. Well, except the six, of course, because if you're in three, six, nine, you want to keep the sixes. But two, four, eight, you would want to let those go. So these are ways that you can simplify your discard planning. Useless tiles which lately I've been, all of these, I've been calling misfit tiles as a category. All, all three of these bullets are misfits. Useless, inefficient, isolated, and subordinate. Those would be easy discard planning. And then with those misfit tiles, you just mitigate the risk if you're in the Charleston and you're discarding, uh, um, you're creating passes, you want to mitigate the risk. And if you're in the pick and discard phase of the game, you want to look at what is out and discard the best tile at the time based on exposures, discards, and what's in your hand. And then look at those misfit tiles and pick and choose which is best to go out and when. Okay, so the next thing with discard planning would be to optimize you want to optimize hand development and also optimize joker exchange potential. And there are some strategies or tactics that you can use to help optimize for joker exchange, especially. One is called outside in, and I've got lots of videos uh, with that topic. Also inside out, which is the opposite of outside in. Basically, you have a range of nine numbers, it, one through nine, three suits, Outside in would be one, two, three, and nine, eight, seven in that order. So one and nine, two and eight, three and seven. So outside in. If you discard from outside in, you're going to optimize with efficient tiles. Maybe those are going to be more likely in exposures with jokers. The kicker with outside in to optimize for joker exchange is that you need to switch that thinking or switch the tactic by before the end of the third wall because the, the inside out tiles, the more efficient tiles, three through seven, those are going to be more and more risky as the game progresses. So then towards the end of the third wall, you want to switch that optimization to inside out. If you're going to play to win, you want to discard the efficient tiles first because those are more likely going to be used by your opponents. So the outside in are going to be more safe discards typically than the ones on the inside of that nine number range. And then you also want to optimize for joker exchange by holding pairs that you don't need. If they happen to, to develop in the begin game or in the early part of the middle game, you may be able to plan your discards so that you can give your opponents time to develop their hand enough or to a point where when you discard one of the pair tiles that you don't need, and they will then call it with an exposure with a joker. And then on your next turn, you do the joker exchange. That is called Joker Bait. And by the way, that was coined by Tom Sloper of Sloperama. So thank you, Tom, for that fabulous idea. It is a hit or miss tactic, but when it works, it's fun and fantastic. And it helps your hand uh, more times. Well, I wouldn't say more times than not, but if you can get a Joker with Joker Bait, it's, it's a great feeling. All right. So the next defensive category that I want to share when it comes to discard planning is sabotage. When you're in the middle of the game, the middle game, third wall, this is typically when you can identify what hand your opponents are playing, especially if they have two exposures or more. And if they're exhibiting physical tells, this is where social intelligence and situational awareness comes in because you're going to be gathering information 
that is available typically when you play in person. You don't have that benefit when you play online, which is why I mentioned the setting and the format early in this presentation. But you can gather information and sabotage your opponent's hand. And this sometimes works well, especially if you decide to fold in that middle game, because you want to make sure that you're not going to harm your own hand. And, and you can sometimes plan it so that you're using tiles that maybe your opponent might need. So these are the three ways that you can sabotage. The first is destruction. For example, if you see somebody who maybe is playing a year hand, then maybe they have a Pong of twos and a Kong of twos, and they had a hesitation when a white dragon went down and you have the potential to Kong a white dragon with a joker or two and use the, the white dragon for your own hand development. You can destroy their potential if they are in fact playing a year hand by calling a discard to make a Kong that could destroy their hand or at least limit their ability to develop their hand further because unless they get jokers, if they are in fact playing a year hand and you now have a Kong of white dragons, it's going to hurt their hand development or it's going to hinder their ability to improve their hand development because you now have that exposure. You, you, you used a sabotage tech, tactic. Another one is inaction. And this is where you intentionally avoid discarding a tile that you know your opponents will likely need. Whether you use that tile for your own hand or whether you fold and just hoard the tiles, that's up to you, but it, that is called inaction where you're going to refrain or you're going to avoid discarding a tile because you know that your opponent needs it. The best thing to do is try to use the tile in your own hand, of course, but if you can't, then that might mean a decision to fold and then you would hoard those risky tiles. The other sabotage that you can use is wastage. This is when you would forego doing a joker exchange to avoid making another player's hand jokerless. That's called wastage. You're wasting that symbol tile that could have been used to do a joker exchange because you don't want to make their hand pure or jokerless. Another example of wastage would be, let's see, there was another one, two different ones of wastage would be, I can't think of it at the moment, Joker Exchange or Discarding a Joker. That's what it is. Discarding a Joker, like in the end game. Let's say that you decide to fold and you want the game to end in a draw or a wall game, you're going to discard a joker. That would be wastage. So typically that brings a cringe at the table from your opponents, especially if multiple jokers go down, that is wastage. You're wasting the jokers uh, and it can be painful. So those are ways to sabotage because it takes the jokers, excuse me, out of play. So for example, if I use a joker in, expo in an exposure, there, there could be potential for someone to do an exchange. But if I discard the joker, it just wastes it completely. So sabotage can happen three ways, destruction, inaction, and wastage. You can use all three of these tactics when you're planning discards. Always trying though to develop your own hand as your priority. So simplify, optimize, sabotage. All right. Last, we're going to talk about the risk assessment matrix. 
Okay, so this comes in when you get towards the end of the third wall and you're going into the middle or the end game. And you're starting to draw tiles that could be risky. And you want to make sure that you're making the best decisions based on what is visible at the table, which includes discards and exposures. Sometimes you can tell what your opponents are playing if they have two exposures or more. And sometimes you can even tell if they have one exposure based on their behavior at the table. When tiles are discarded, you can monitor their expressions, their body language, their tile manipulation to figure out what hand they're playing, even with one exposure. Online, it's kind of hard to do. But in person, there's a lot more information that you can gather to help you with risk assessment and decide whether or not you're going to play to win or switch to defense. Push or fold. That's what the choice is. All right, so let's talk about this table. So on the left, we have likelihood. The likelihood of, ri of risk is that's going to happen. Uh, on the top, on the top side, we have the impact that it's going to create. So likelihood and impact. On the impact side, you want to think about there's a uh, an acceptable level of impact that you're willing to accept you're willing to it, the impact is acceptable basically is what we're thinking here on the acceptable column then there's tolerable unacceptable and intolerable and then we're going to break it down so you can kind of put you can quantify it the first is under impact for acceptable levels if someone has no exposures that would be an acceptable impact. Like uh, you, you, it's very difficult to figure out what someone is playing if they have no exposure. Sometimes you can figure it out by looking at the discards in front of them, but it, you would be making big assumptions. If someone has one exposure and you can see the discards in front of them and figure out maybe what they're playing in addition to using social awareness, um, or social intelligence and the situational awareness, discards, exposures, behavior, you might be able to figure out what they're playing with one exposure. And that would maybe be a tolerable impact. And then for unacceptable is when you start seeing players with two exposures. You should be able to tell what hand someone is playing when they have two exposures. And if you draw a risky tile, then the impact is going to be more on the unacceptable side. And you're going to need to make a decision. Do I really want to discard this tile? And then you have intolerable. This is where you're going to see someone with three exposures, where you know what tile they need. Because the options are limited with the more exposures they have. And you can also tell the type of hand they're playing and the value that you may have to pay. So on the acceptable side, a 25-point hand is not as painful as paying for a winning hand of quince. So you have a 25-point hand under acceptable, tolerable, 30, unacceptable for a quint, intolerable, quint, and singles and pairs. So if you're playing the game, for example, and someone in the middle game has a quint, I'm definitely going to heighten my defensive play. Because I do not want to discard a tile that is going to have an unacceptable impact because they're playing a quint. That's going to come with expense. So think about the impact when you are drawing tiles from the wall and making decisions on whether you're going to push or fold. So now let's talk about the likelihood and we're going to bring it all together. When you draw a tile from the wall, and, it, and based on what you see in discards or exposures, you decide that that is going to have an improbable likelihood of giving somebody a winning hand. 
or the opportunity to further develop their hand. If you can account for three tiles with or without exposures, and then also consider the availability of jokers, you want to think about those variables while you're assessing the likelihood of the, the risk that you will take with a tile drawn from the wall based on what you see. So improbable would be, for example, that you see two tiles out, maybe that discard won't be as risky as a tile that you draw from the wall where there's only one out. So we have improbable, and then we have possible, where that tile could possibly give somebody a winning hand. And then we have probable. So improbable, possible, probable. Probable would be an example where there are no discards out yet. It's a fresh tile. It has not been discarded. That is going to be, have a probable likelihood of giving somebody a winning hand. So improbable would be the risk is unlikely to occur. Possible risk is likely to occur. And probable risk is most likely to occur. So now we're going to bring it together and see the risk level. So in the acceptable column, improbable would be low risk. Possible would also be low under the acceptable column, no exposures. And then it goes up a little bit if you draw a probably, you know, you, you draw a tile that will maybe have some risk. But if someone, let's say all three opponents have no exposures, then it's going to have a medium risk even if no tiles are out yet. Even, even if that means that there's a probable risk there, that someone may advance their hand with an exposure or maybe even mahjong. So you want to think about that low risk to medium and then under the tolerable column when people have maybe one exposure out, then we're going to start seeing an increase in risk, medium to high. So the improbable goes to medium, possible to medium, and probable goes up to high, high level of risk under tolerable when someone has one exposure. And then under unacceptable, it goes up even more. So if someone has two exposures and you draw a tile that maybe only one tile is out, that's going to be a possible risky tile for someone with two exposures. You see the high there, there's a high risk. So visualize this table as you draw those tiles from the wall to help you assess the impact and the likelihood of what will happen when you discard that tile. Is it gonna have a low impact or acceptable impact with a, a low risk? Or is it going to be a medium risk under an unacceptable situation? So you want to think about this matrix to help you decide whether or not you want to accept the risk or not. If you get over to the intolerable side, you can see that it goes from high to extreme. So if someone has three exposures and you draw a tile where only one is out, let's say that would be a possible winning tile for that player who has three exposures, that is an extreme risk. So you are probably better to fold your hand. So think about this table as you decide whether or not to discard tiles, especially in the end game. Fourth wall, you want to look at your own hand and decide the potential you have to win versus the risk of discarding tiles based on what you see at the table. And incidentally, you can download this. I have this free to download from the wiki. There's a link. There should be a link in the video description below. If not, I'll add it. And you can download this. It's a two-sided uh, cuttable, I guess you could say, downloadable that you can cut and fit into your card and take with you as you practice. 
I highly recommend not taking it to a, a serious game, though, a competitive game or a tournament. It's something that you want to use as you practice or maybe use it at home while you study and learn how to play defensively. Any questions about this risk assessment matrix? I hope you find it helpful. We're going to talk about fold judgment next, and then we'll play Mahjong. And we'll hopefully have gameplay with commentary We can where I can sort of demonstrate some of these concepts. Okay, so now we're going to talk about fold judgment. If you think the potential of getting your winning tile is slim, fold. What that means is that you're going to keep all the risky tiles based on that risk assessment matrix that we just talked about. You're going to keep those risky tiles and you're going to break up your hand and discard as safely as possible to force a draw, a.k.a. wall game. Do not claim discards for an exposure. The reason for that is because it gives away information to other players. Just stay, keep everything in your hand concealed if you can. If you already have exposures, that's fine. But don't make any more exposures. Stay concealed if you can, if, you're, if you've decided to fold. Discard tiles that have been exposed or that have been previously discarded. So tiles that you see on the table. If you can account for three, that's ideal because the fourth tile is probably the safest besides a joker, which is the safest tile you can discard because it can't be used. After that, it would be once you account for three tiles, whether in exposures or discards. And then you go from there. Three tiles are out, except for year tiles like a zero, a white dragon. That, that's going to be pretty risky. Dragons are going to be risky to discard. Wins will be risky to discard. You want to try to discard from the outside in. Outside in, the efficient tiles are going to be risky. So think about the risk based on the tiles that you see first. And then do the best you can with your discards. Keep the risky ones to the side. Break up your hand and discard safely. Jokers, of course, cannot be claimed. So that is the sure bet for discarding jokers in the end game. And I just want to leave you with this. I know it's a lot. I hope you rewatch this video to learn more. And the bottom line is with this, these ideas, the smarter you play, the luckier you will be. That is a quote by Mark Pilarski. I hope I pronounced that right. He is a gambling aficionado, casino guru, and I love it. The smarter you play, the luckier you'll be. And now let's play Mahjong. Don't forget to check Mosh Life, moshlife.com. I have a wiki with lots of articles on strategies. There's also a link in the video description below to the, the um, risk assessment matrix, and also the skills and strategies matrix where we talk about all these different ways for you to develop your skills and add powerful strategies to the way you play the game so that you can play smarter. The smarter you play, the luckier you'll be. That's in a nutshell what I'm trying to convey. All right, let's play. I hope you found that helpful. Let me know what you think. What what uh, playing style do you think that you you are? I, I say I'm a shark. I am a shark at the table, I have to admit. I'm a mahjong shark. So watch out. I'm playing at your table. I'm going to play to win more times than not. But that just means that I, I tend to take risks. So let's uh, let's play Mahjong and see if I can demonstrate some of these ideas. Is everybody with me? Let's play here. Okay. 
So all those topics are in my next book that I hope to be publishing in the next few weeks. I'm very excited about it, and I hope you are too. You can learn a new way of playing, a paradigm shift, basically. It's playing from a deeper level. That's my hope. It's a lot to think about. Sue's a shark. Oh, my goodness. So just remember, there's a stingray, uh, which is passive. Uh, let's see. It's um, fixed passive. And then we have the orca, which is fixed adaptive. And then we have a dolphin, which is, let's see, it would be uh, a uh assertive adaptive assertive and then the shark which is oh no the shark is adaptive assertive the dolphin is fixed and oh my gosh i'm still memorizing it it's all still new to me i only this is this is one of the epiphanies that i had and so i'm still figuring it out let me pull that back up i'm still memorizing it Okay, so East one, let's see, we have Red Dragon Pair, 6825561234. I think we should let this go. Okay, so let me pull that back up. Oh. Okay, so Stingray is pass, uh, passive. Let me see here. Here's a four, seven, four, seven, six, eight dragon pair. Okay, so what we're focused on is this dragon. Okay, so we have five, seven, five, six, four, six, eight, no two, three, four, dragon, four, six, eight, dragon, no flowers. Really, this dragon is not helpful unless we get, unless we get. A, a seven nine and dots though so that's a that's a big gap let's see here we have one three five six seven let's keep the bands all right so let me go back down there okay here we go uh, here we go fixed it fixed passive is a stingray fixed assertive is an orca adaptive passive is a dolphin and adaptive assertive is a shark Adaptive assertive is a shark. That's my tendency. Adaptive passive is a dolphin. Fixed assertive is an orca. Fixed passive is a stingray. Okay, let's see if we can leverage this pair of eight, eight bands. Okay, we have two, four. Looks like we're going to be playing some kind of a a two, four, six, eight hand, maybe. Let's see, three, four, five, six dragon. We should definitely keep going. All right, two, four, east. Let's see what happens with this one. We have a gap, no, no flowers. We can maybe try to play the concealed hand, but we have no flowers. Concealed, consecutive. Okay, so let's see here. We have three, four, five, six, no two, four, six, eight. We're passing across. We have to pass. Three, four, five, six, dragon. Since we have no two, we're going to let the eight go. I'm kind of thinking we should play three, four, five, six, pong, 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 pong. Second hand down. Okay, we didn't get any keepers, so let's just keep that eight. We have a one, one, four. We're going to pass across. This one, one bam is really not very helpful. If we pass two, maybe keep the one. They want two. We could maybe keep the one if we can get a two bam. Although if we get a two bam, we could do two, four, six, eight concealed maybe. 
we might see the eight bam back. We got the one. Okay, four dot can go. All right, four now dots. let's see what is our position. I would say we have seven. We have characters. one, three, four, five, six, eight. We don't know what hand we're playing. One we have dot. a gap, no flower. I'd say, well, we could do three, four, five, six, no gaps, but we have one character. one discard with two pair, two pair joker bait. I'd say we're probably five discards. Let's throw the one. I'd say we're probably one a contender move. for this game because we five we dots. could play three, four, five, six, no gaps. Three, four, four five, six, or four, five, six, seven. Probably the eight can go. So we have two discards with Joker beat. Nine characters. And an option. I'd say we're a contender. So that means we can take moderate Best risk. Wind. Moderate risk with this hand. We have three Jokers. We might risk exposing these Five Jokers. Fingers. So here we have to decide. And I would call. So let's see. With a five bam and a pung of fours, I would probably pung. Hmm. Minimize the the Joker usage here, and I would discard the dragon. Green dragon. That's going to be more and more risky as the game goes on. So we have a pung. We're going to do three, four, five, six. Pung kong, pung Green kong. Green dragon. Okay, so we'll pass. So we could we could pung the three seven characters. And then we could either Kong the four or the six, but not both. Five bamboos. Okay, so someone got our Joker, and that's okay. Nine bamboos. We have four discards, and we're still in the middle, in the begin game, actually. So, Green Dragon. With two Jokers, we have a weakness with our six bam. Flower. I would say we're probably a, Eight a contender still. <laughs> we need another good pick. Five characters. We need another good pick here. One bamboo. Okay, five bam pung. Three, four, five, six is what we're playing. Three bamboo. Okay, I would pung. Pung. All right, now let's discard the eight. We're using outside in. Eight bamboo. So the eight goes first. We'll keep the four. The four crack, even though the four crack is out as a discard flower, maybe someone just wasn't ready for it. Five bamboos. Nine bamboos. People probably know what we're playing with Come two on. discards here. A nine Six bam calm. I would probably, okay, we can't call that. We're going to need to dedicate a joker because we need a kong of sixes so i would probably discard the seven bam next because we don't know seven bamboo there it is seven bam let's see if they take it no they don't okay so they they likely won't need it let's throw the seven dot instead seven dots there's an eight dot out seven bam out four crack out so these one dot are probably safe discards if you think about darn it uh, if you think about the Red likelihood dragon. of these discards being Red risky win. it's going to be low okay so let's let the year tile go two dot. and we're still going to discard from the outside in so eight dot will go next hmm. then the seven and then the four this is one reason why two i like bamboos. to discard the year tiles they could be playing a year One hand. Character. Okay, so we got a keeper. Eight dots. We'll be able to con the four, but we need help with that six. Dragon. And we are going to need a joker. We we have one. No fours are out yet, so con. we'll be able to do a pure con. There's our year hand. Two dot. They're playing the first hand. Two characters. So they need bams. Three bam. Two, two bam, three Five bam. Characters. Okay, we do not want to hold on to that. Flower. We're 60 tiles. Well, one pick away. 60 tiles Red is the very dragon. middle of the game. Very middle of the game. Three dots. 
we have two discards so we're doing pretty good right now i'd still Eight say characters. we're a contender because we, we Seven need bamboos we need the sixes in here there's already Five one dots. out we do have a joker to help us it would be Eight really wins. nice to draw a six spam that would be ideal there's three East wind. jokers up for grabs okay now this nine crack it is out but i think i think that would be a good discard nine right now characters okay oh you know what they could be playing oh well, no no they are playing the first year uh year hand eight i was characters. thinking maybe they're playing the two eight dragon hand but those are opposite dragons flower okay we don't want dragons Green dragon. We're looking, we're looking for a nine crack, two dot, white Green dragon. Wind. It'd be nice if we can do a joker exchange, and then we'll be set. Nine dots. Okay, no hesitation on the nines. So they may be doing One consecutive then over there. Oh, look, we got the three. All right, let's discard the fours. Four dots. And this four crack probably is going to be safe. Nine dots. The three bam will be safe because we have a pump right One there. Dot. So we're going to hold that. We're going into the very end of Two the middle bamboos. game right now. Oh, I'm surprised they didn't take that. Maybe they're doing two, three and cracks. And they just One had an bamboo. extra two crack. They must be doing two, three and cracks. Two bamboos. Because the twos are down eight characters so a, a two three cracker are, are going to be very risky and after this One pick character. we'll be in the end game okay four crack already went down nobody wanted it let's throw the four four characters no little tiny bit of hesitation wow. the player on our left may have a four but Five dots. there are no takers nope they have Seven eight. Okay, so let's see. News concealed with seven eight. Over here, two three in cracks. Over here, three six nine. They're playing a three six nine hand. And then over here, we're doing three four five six. All right, let's play again. We need a player at the table here. And we're off. Off on a new adventure, new game. We have a Joker, and then we have a pair of ones. One, three, five, seven, nine, no gaps. Let's throw south green or that's a red sorry i was looking at my bams let's see one three five seven nine five seven let's let the four bam go we do have some potential for the odd pair hand we'd have to throw away a joker though i'd rather use it and play the first hand one suit odds Let's see, one, three, five. We might be able to do the concealed hand for some score, 30 point hand. Okay, we have a one and a seven. All right, so we're kind of in between one, seven, three can go, seven can go, one, three, five, five, seven, nine concealed. But we have one, three, five, seven, nine, pair seven. I think what I would do here is probably one, three, five. I would probably let the one dot go. Play one, three, five, seven, nine. Oh, one, three, four. Mm, that's a little bit risky. Let's see here. Let's do four, one, and then let the seven go. So let's focus on one suit, one, three, five, seven, nine. Leveraging the one dot and the seven dot multiples. It'd be great if we can pick up a nine dot. That's our, our really, our, the most, the riskiest 
component of this hand because that needs to be a pair. All right, now here, I would not pass one, two, three in one suit. That would be very risky. So I think we should do one, seven, three. One, seven, three. Okay, we got the one back. We did get a seven. We have a five. I'm still thinking about that concealed hand. We're passing across though. So we have one, three, five, seven, nine, seven crack, five bam. Let's throw the seven, throw, pass, whatever. Oh, we got a seven. Okay, so now seven dot right there here's a one let's pass one six one dot six bam i'm kind of thinking one three five seven nine really our our biggest weakness is the nine dot and then the five dot we need to build one three five seven nine and one suit We have people negotiating low. Okay. Let's see if we can get a keeper out of here. No, we, oh, oh my gosh. That, that's kind of shocking, really. Okay. Five, seven. They want three. Five, seven. We have a seven dot pung. So. I think what I would do is pass fully. Somebody gave us a pair. Right across left, left across right. This player on the left gave us a pair. Let's see here. It seems nobody wants the seven. All right. Let's pass. We'll pass all three. I don't know if we're going to get keepers out of this one. It's way too early for Joker bait. That's why I'm breaking up the one. We would have to get that one crack pair all the way to 60 tiles. Wow, another really risky pass. That is risky. Oh, my goodness. This could be an indicator that everybody has a well-developed hand, except the player on the right. Seven they, characters. They passed fully. One character. The player across from us gave us a super risky pass, and the player to our left gave us a risky pass. One so dot. my guess is that they have a well developed they both have well developed hands. We got a keeper. Red dragon. We're one away from a really strong hand. I would say we we are probably a front runner. We have three discards and two weaknesses. Three we need the five dot and a nine dot. Pat three dots. They passed blind for that one. Oh, okay. We're gonna pung. Hmm. So it, it was just happenstance. One character. The player across from us gave us a one, um, was it a two, Six bamboo. two, three red. Five All right. Thank bamboos. you, Anne. They passed blind. One dot. Oh, that's one of the challenges of passing blind. All right. We need... We need Green a nine characters. dot or a five dot. If we get a five dot, we could Kong and be ready on a nine, but I Green don't like characters. waiting on a single tile. I don't like waiting Seven for a, a, to win with a pair tile. It's very risky because if somebody has a, a pung with a joker of the tile you need, you're in Four trouble. Dots. So it would be really nice if we can Two draw characters. a nine dot. I would feel much better about this hand if we got the nine dot. Four bamboos.
four dots. So nine dot would be ideal. We'll nine take, dots. Oh, there's the nine dot. Nobody wanted it. So that's a good thing. We may be okay. Six dots. We need to watch for nine. Three characters. We need to watch for nine dots now. White dragon. Hesitation on that. West wind. Okay. Three, three bam can go. Three bamboos. Two characters. Four characters. Nine dot would be the ideal pick for us. Seventy-five tiles remaining. Two dots. Eight crack. That's an outside tile, edge tile. We don't Eight need that. Eight characters. So we'll we'll discard outside in this five. These fives. Well, let's see the five bam. I think that can go. It was already Six discarded bamboos. and nobody wanted it. So we can escalate that as a discard. West wind. Two dots. Okay, one bam. I don't see any one bams. Five bamboos. We'll let that go next. That's on the edge. Four characters. There's a hesitation on the four crack. Two dots. And we have a five crack. We might be able to get a joker exchange out of that. Four dots. Oh, east. No. East wind. We need a nine dot. White dragon. South wind. Okay, nine dot. We need a nine dot. Seven characters. A five bam. All right. We already discarded a five bam. One Nobody bamboo. wanted it to our out. That should be safe later. We're at 60 tiles now. This is the very middle of the game. We have Three two dragons. discards. We have a pretty good chance to win. We need that Please nine dot win. though. That would, oh, one bam. <laughs> one bam. It would be really nice to draw a nine dot. I would feel Four. much better about this hand if we can do that. But if we draw a joker or Seven a five, characters. we'll be okay. We'll Kong, and then we'll be ready on a nine. But, of course, with two exposures, they're going to know what we're five playing. Bamboos. Right now, we're what I call semi-stealth mode. We have one exposure. There's a five dot. Five characters. Not, not ideal, but we'll take it. Uh, so bamboos. I would say we're a front runner at this point. We have 53 tiles remaining and one discard. So Easy I'd say win. you can bump yourself up depending on where you are in the wall for picking. We, we're still in the middle game. We have one discard. Four bamboos. So I would bump us up. Let's see how many seven cracks are out. Three and five. Let's let the five go. Five there are three seven cracks out recently. Green dragon. So let's see. Five cracks are out. Five bams are out. So no one's playing like numbers. And there's also ones and threes out. So I don't think anyone's playing little odds or like numbers with fives. Somebody, Five somebody could still be playing no Norse are out. This is going to be a bit risky. North wind. Somebody could still be playing consecutive with fives. Two like, bamboos. Like mix suit five, six, seven, or mix suit four, five, six, let's say. Uh, so we still could have a contender for the five dot. Nine characters. We're looking for, hi, Kathleen. We're looking for a nine dot from the wall. Four bamboos. That would be ideal. Ah, oh, six ban. Six bamboos. These are out. Eight characters. We are looking for five dot to Kong ready on the nine. I would Eight love, bamboos. love, love to draw that nine dot. It's 
best not to be waiting on a pair. Five characters. Two dot. We don't want to hold that. Two dots. Six dots. Eight bamboos. Eight bamboos. Okay, we need a nine dot from the wall. Oh, three, 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 three cracks are out. Three characters. So we're okay there. Three dots. Green dragon. Eight bamboos. One crack, one crack. No, two are out. One character. Three bamboos. Okay. Nine dots. Uh-oh. Getting tight. There's only one more. One character. Okay, six dot just went down. Six dots. We may have to switch to defense. Flower. In other words, fold. Now in Mahjong, when you fold, you don't muck your tiles. White dragon. You keep playing. You just discard defensively. Four bamboos. Oh, west. West. All green. right, so we have five more picks, one discard. Still no five dots out. Two bamboos. It would be awesome if someone discards a five dot. We could, let me see, what do we need to Kong? We need to Kong. Five dots. There it is. All right, let's Kong. Kong. Of course, everyone knows what we are going to need here. Seven Although characters. we could be playing one, three, three, five. Maybe someone, maybe someone will throw the nine dot. Thinking we're playing little odds. Two characters. If someone takes that five, we'll be ready on a pure hand. This Two could, bamboos. Oh, I'm thinking that could be a risky tile. Sometimes bamboos. when there's a hesitation in the end game, maybe they have a... Oh, shoot. News concealed. Concealed hand, so I do not feel bad about discarding that tile. There were there was also a north out. Um, I don't feel bad about that. We're ready to win. I play to win. That's the shark in me. Here we have a two four six eight concealed even hand. I guess over here eight nine quint eight nine quint, and then this was our winner. We're ready to win on a nine dot, which is in the wall, by the way. Okay, next. We're going to play again. Hopefully, we'll get to play at least two more games. We shall see. We're going to try. All brown belts at the table. Oh, we've got jokers. All right, let's see. We have a lot of cracks, but here we have an eight dot pair. Eight dot pair. What do we have here? It was in the wall. Yes. Okay, we have an eight dot pair. All right, East can go. Dragon can go. Part of me is wondering if the cracks will come in. We have one, three, five, seven, nine here, but also five, six, seven. Let's see, six, seven, eight, five, six, seven, one, three. Let's let the three go because we do have some consecutive potential here. All right, so we have an eight, nine. There's eight, nine, one west, maybe. Okay, now we have to make a choice. We have to let something go. We have five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight dot pair, six, seven, eight, nine. We have a flower. That's really not helpful, but I don't pass flowers typically. Let's let the nine go. 
six, seven, eight, nine. Let's see, eight, nine, eight, nine, six, seven, five, five, seven, eight, nine, eight, one. Let's let the five go. So six, seven, eight, nine, we have an eight dot pair. Here's a six and a nine. So we have six, seven, eight, nine. There's a nine dot. That's what we needed in our hand. So we have six, seven, eight, nine, no gaps. Pung Kong, Pung Kong. Let's see, we could do six, seven, eight, eight. If we get an eight, bam. This is gonna be a little bit risky. Eight, nine, and one suit or north, south with an eight. I think eight, nine would be less risky. We could pass blind. We could pass one blind. Where are we? Six, seven, eight, nine. Six, seven, eight. Let's risk it. Six, seven, eight, nine, Pung Kong. Okay, so the risk was worth it. We picked up a keeper and we have three tiles to pass. So really it's getting tight for us though because we have four discards, four discards. We're gonna keep going. North one nine. No keepers. We've got tiles to pass. It worked out nice. All right, eight, nine. We need nine dots again. Six, seven, eight, nine. Everybody's passing fully. No keepers. Oh, that was a cross pass. Of course, everyone's passing fully. You have to. All right. Now everybody's passing fully. All right. We got a nine, but it's the wrong suit. We could maybe keep it. I guess no. I don't think so. I'd rather pass fully. Let's see how many our opponent wants. We, we okay, three. They want to do three. We can do three. We're playing six, seven, eight, nine, Pung Kong, Pung Kong. We could Pung the six, pure. Kong the seven with the Joker. Pung the eight. We have a Joker for the nine. So we need a nine dot in here. Oh, all right. Well, we got an six eight. Bamboos. We got an eight crack back. All right. Well, let's just see how this nine goes. Characters. We have six, seven, eight, eight, nine, nine. Nine characters. We ended up with, oh, that's interesting. North wind. There's six, seven dragon now. So I, since the nine cracks are down, let's let that go. And the nine bam, we can let that go. East wind. I'm thinking probably Four the characters. dragon can go too. But we can hold it for a little bit. Flower. That's nine why bamboo. I was thinking maybe we should hold it. So maybe Fine we can bamboo. use the eight dot for Joker bait. Play six, seven dragon instead of six, seven, eight, nine. Let's just seven see bamboos. what happens with the nine dot. Seven characters. All right. We need to Kong either way for that one. Kong. Even if we played Pung Kong, Pung Kong, Eight the seven characters. would be a Kong. If we play the dragon hand, we would need to build on that dragon. Either way, we need to build the nine or the dragon. Nine dot. Yep, there goes the nine dot, and we're not ready for it. And there's a bit of a hesitation there. So I think we should play six, seven, six, seven nine dragon. Dots. Six, seven dragon. We'll see if we can get this eight dot to 60 tiles. Red dragon. Oh, darn. Oh, now we're going to need a joker. Well, five bamboo. We'll see. We can use the joker for the six. We're going to need a joker Green for dragon. the red. 
No, we don't want the dragon. Green dragon. Four bamboos. Nine dots. South wind. All right, let's let the three go. Three characters. So we have a seven crack Kong. Let's see, eight dot pair. Nine bam out, six bam seven out. Dots. I would stick with this hand, even though there's a red dragon out. Green dragon. Oh, seven okay. bamboos. Okay, now eight bam. That's really not going to be helpful. There's already one out. Eight bamboos. We can con that six. Seven dots. We need to we need to build our red. Nine. Characters. I would love to draw a six crack. Nine that way we dots. can use that joker. Oh, all right. Six so there's dots. an option. Six, seven, eight, mix suit Kongs. There's Kong. one six bam out. Seven dots. Oh, nine bams already out. Nine bamboos. No eight dots are out. One six bam is out. We're in between six, seven, eight, mix suit Kongs. Or One six, bamboo. seven, dragon. Okay, now this six dot is available for exchange. Five bamboos. Four bamboos. Eight crack. I guess we could keep that. Six, bamboo. six seven, eight, mixed, or uh, one suit Kongs. One is out. White dragon. I think we discarded it. Either us or this player on the left. North wind. All right. Well, let's see what happens here. Two characters. 60 tiles. We're in the middle of the game, and we have a pair we don't need. Four bams out. Four bamboos. West wind. <laughs> Nine Riley. Characters. It's dinner time. Sorry about Red Riley. Red Riley's red crying. Okay, shoot. Oh, we need a, another joker there. Five I'm kind of thinking six, seven, eight, one suit Kongs. Because now we need another joker for that red dragon. Two characters. Okay, 54 tiles. We need to let this Five eight dot go. We've, we're, we're beyond the expiration date. Eight dots. See if we can get a joker. No. So we need to let this go lickety split. Eight dots. Oh, there it is, probably. This player on the right here. West wind. Two dots. Eight dots. All right, there's two south south. No three bands are out. We're at 47 tiles. We're three still characters. in the middle game. We need to let this three bam go. This is our riskiest tile right now. If we're Seven playing dots. to win, we don't want to have a, a fresh Two tile. Dots. Three bamboos. Okay, now there are two two cracks out. And there are two souths out. It appears. Oh, good. All right, pass. So nobody wants the two. Three are out. That'll be good later. The south Five two are characters. out. It looks like nobody's playing wins. North win. Joker exchange. Seven characters. Thank you. South okay, win. now we have six, seven, eight, one suit Kongs. East How win. many eight? One eight crack is out. No six cracks are out. Two dots. There are two red dragons out. Eight so it's bamboos. really a matter of what we draw. Two dot, three are out. Two crack, three are out. Two dots. We're in the end game now. End game. We have two White apparently dragon. or likely. Actually, let's think about the risk assessment Eight matrix. Uh, these are nine bamboo. Prob probably safe discards. Two and now, characters. now we're finally set at 31 tiles remaining. 
we're ready to come ready to come but if we have one more exposure people are going to know what we're doing it'd be nice if we can draw oh there it is exchange and now we'll discard that safe discard red and we're ready to win on a double weight six or eight one of two tiles double weight character we have a pretty good chance of winning pretty good probability we have a high probability of winning this game three dots six crack eight crack joker oh that's already out six bamboos interesting hesitation that was a little bit scary six bamboos okay there it is i wonder if they were playing a three, three six nine dots. hand over here eight dots oh four crack one is out this will be a little risky four characters a little bit risky there pung. okay pung is good i hope they're not playing Please a two win. four six eight hand they have a two crack in front of them with a pung of force green dragon pung of force they're not playing a two four six eight hand there's that's that's four not possible bamboos. four dot oh they could be doing four five four five this this is risky i'd play to win though four dots four five four five pung oh my goodness one dot all right we need a six eight crack come on We're semi stealth mode. Three bamboos. With one exposure, people aren't going to be able to tell what we're doing. Now, this four dot, that is available one for exchange. Dot. Nine bam, that should be safe. Three are out. Nine bamboo. Okay, so we have uh, three more picks. Six there it is mahjong Woohoo! oh my goodness okay so they're doing two three four four i thought they were doing four five four five because over here are the fives right here so over here we have one two or two three four four ready to win on a two band but i thought they were oh they're not out they're they're in the wall over here we have a two band but here's the five dot four five six kongs and then we have a hand ones like numbers with ones they need flowers yeah that's painful that's a painful situation there all right let's play one more hand we can squeeze in one more hand maybe <clears throat> uh oh what happened I thought we joined a game kind of booted us thank you thank you for the kudos on that one a <laughs> shark win we were we were playing we were a shark we were swimming we were swimming for food we wanted we wanted some, a winning tile there so we were on hunt all right let's go okay we've got oh no riley no Riley. oh boy hold on shoot all right we had a delivery so riley's freaking out darn it sorry about that okay so we have an eight dot pair we have some two four six eight in here but we have a gap no six so let's let the one go we have east and south. Let's let the red go. We have some two, four, six, eight potential in here. I think I would let, let's see, the two crack go. Because we might be able to do the noose concealed hand. East and south in hand. Okay, so now we have a south and a two dot. Still no six. So one can go. Let's see here. Two BM can go. We have seven, eight, nine, south, east. These, these could maybe be the norths. Seven, eight, nine, or two, four, six, eight. We have a gap, no six. We need to be able to pass here. 
north and west. I kind of want to give this one more chance. Seven, eight, nine, eight, nine, seven. All right, let's let the seven go because we could maybe play two, four, six, eight, Pong Kong, Pong Kong, or eight, nine with news concealed. We've got the six, no gaps now. So no gaps, two, four, six, eight. So let's break up the south and one, four, one, four, nine, four. Might as well let the nine go and keep the four if we're playing evens. Two, four, six, eight, no gaps. We can call. Expedite, expedite hand development here, maybe. Okay, we have a north. Darn. All right. News. We have almost news. Here's six, seven, eight, four, one. We should definitely keep going. I think we should focus on number tiles. So let's let the south go with a one. We're going left. Did we pass a wind? I forget. That's all right. I try to remember what I passed in the first left, but I forgot. All right, we have a 3-7. So we do have some consecutive in there. Let's see. 6-7-8, 4-6-7-8. That doesn't really work. 7-8, northeast, 3. 2-3-4, 6-7-8. I don't want to pass two wins. Since we have seven, eight paired, I think we should let the two go. Six, seven, eight. Let's see if we can get the get the get a nine dot, five dot, nine dot for five, six, seven, eight, or six, seven, eight, nine. We got a one, two. Darn. All right, let's keep the two and we'll let the one green north go. So we still could do two, four, six, eight, let the three go, I suppose. But it would be ideal to get a five dot or a nine dot so we can leverage that seven dot pair. Okay, come on now. Five dot, nine dot. Oh, we got a seven. All right. Well, that kind of solidifies it really. Six, seven, eight. Okay. We can do three. Look at this one suit here. There's no hand for that though. Let's pass two. Three, four, five, six. Six, seven, eight. Four through eight. Doesn't work. Okay, let's see. Three with a dragon, let's do. Okay, so our opponent across from us negotiated low. All right, no harm, no foul here. We have a one bam pair one we don't bamboo. need. Nobody wants it. Nobody wants it, so that'll be a good discard, I guess. Okay, now. Three dots. All right, so we need five dot nine dot North ideally. Wind. Five dot nine dot. We're playing a gap hmm. hand at the moment, and we got skipped. Shoot. We need Two every dots. turn we can get. Okay, let's pass. Sorry, it's South a little dark wind. in here at the moment. Hmm. Oh my goodness. Green dragon. Okay, we need to expedite here. Let's see, six, seven, eight. One dot. I'll pass. One dot. Okay, five, six, seven, eight. East wind. So if they're doing north and south, no hesitation on the east. They are likely doing a run. Flower. They discarded a flower.
eight bamboos. Okay, we're gonna let the ones go. I don't think anyone wants the ones. One bamboo. All right, so we have six bam, six, seven, eight. I nine kept the six dots. bam. Oh, here's a hesitation on the nine. That's interesting. Maybe they're doing seven, eight, nine. West if they're doing seven, eight, nine, they're going to get stuck because we have a pung of sevens. Five this is where dots. we could maybe sabotage. Okay, now here's a six. One bam. bamboo. So we could maybe do, let's West see, wind. five, six, seven, eight. Use this for the five. Five, six, Two seven, bamboos. eight. Pung, kong, pung, kong. Okay. We need a little bit of help in here. We're playing a gap hand. Four dots. Okay, we'll pass. Hesitation on the four. Four dots. We want to try to sabotage at this point. So we want to look for hesitations. Escalate on hesitation tiles. Four bamboos. So the four dot, there was a hesitation, so we let it go. All right, now, ones. I don't Please think anybody win. wants ones. Let's let the twos go next. Two dots. Okay, and next we're going to let the two bam go. Five bamboos. Okay, five bam. Five bam. Let's pass. If another five bam goes down, we could pung. Right now, Seven that, that is a gap for us at the moment. One character. I'll pass. Two bamboos. Okay, so here's a seven crack. That's really not helpful, though. So we have five, six, Two six, dots. seven, eight, seven. We'll just see. We're still kind of gathering, seven gathering, dots. building. Okay, now here we need to decide. That would be a pung for us, probably. So I would just let it go. Five, six, seven, eight, pung, pong. Four characters. We're hoping to draw a five bam, but we don't, we could use jokers here. Oh, seven, eight, seven, eight. All right. So there's a little something Six for dots. us to consider. Seven, eight, seven, eight, pung, kong, pung, kong. There's a seven crack out. Eight there's dots. no gaps there. Okay. Now there we would need to kong either way. So let's kong. Kong. And we'll throw that one dot. One dot. We could do seven eight seven eight or five six seven eight. West wind. Hmm. Either way we Nine have bamboo. Either way we have the weakness. Four dots. It would be ideal to pick a five bam. Oh, we don't want to hold that. Flower. So we're doing either seven, eight, seven, eight, six hand down under consecutive run. Seven characters. Oh, now I would let it go because we would need nine a, bamboos. We would need a joker. There are two seven cracks seven out now. Seven bamboos. Five dot. There's already one. Uh, one out. Five dots. Okay. Four. Three characters. Oh, two, three, four. All right. So they have a winning hand here, north and south with a run. Over here we have two, four, six, eight. Uh, pair hand, maybe. Maybe they're trying for the pair hand. No. Two, four, six, eight. I have no clue. Like numbers with eights, maybe. Okay, over here. Oh, that's us. And then over here, 369 of some kind. Oh, man. I, I thought we would be a contender on this one, but we had a ways to go. All right, that's going to do it. That's going to do it for this live stream. I hope that you enjoyed the concept of game theory mindset. It's just a way to approach the game from a new perspective and play it from a deeper level because we're adding layers, layers, leveraging poker theory. So, or poker psychology, I guess you could say. 
really profiling players, that's poker psychology. So I hope that you enjoyed it. If you missed the presentation at the beginning, watch the repost and let me know what you think about these ideas. I think that they are helpful, especially for competitive players. If you play in tournaments, this could be a game changer for you. I think it could be a game changer because it can give you an advantage at the table if you learn how to read the room. And that includes poker psychology modified and applied to American Mahjong. So give it a thought. Let me know what you think. Write your comments under the video or send me an email. Or you could always reach out on Facebook as well. Oh, thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for coming. We'll see you on Friday. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ann. Thank you, Sue. Thanks for being here, JL, Deborah, Mona, Ann, Kathleen. Thank you so much, Sue. I think Evelyn had to take off. But again, thank you, Candace and Judy, for joining us, channel members. I appreciate your support. Thank you, too, for watching my videos, for sharing about Mosh Life. I appreciate the support. If anybody has any questions, write them in caps in the or in live chat. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and sign off. All right. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, consider subscribing. Click the little gray bell if you do. That way you'll get notification for when I post new videos. And you won't miss an opportunity to learn a new strategy or pick up an insight to the game that could give you an advantage at the table. Between now and the next video, may all your picks be keepers. <laughs>